Now, I'm going to do a few extracts from the fall of Phaeton, Bullfinch's, Bullfinch's mythology, because it, it, it refers back to what the priests prefaced the story of Atlantis with by recounting the myth of Phaeton. Now, I'm not going to read the whole thing. It's a really interesting account. If you can get a used copy or something of Bullfinch's mythology, it makes a very interesting read, but I'm going to just hit the high spots here. So Phaeton was the son of Apollo and the nymph Clymene, and one day a schoolfellow laughed at the idea of his being the son of the god, and Phaeton went in rage and shame and reported it to his mother. If, said he, I am indeed of heavenly birth, give me, mother, some proof of it, and establish my claim to the honor. Clymene stretched forth her hands towards the skies and said, I call to witness the sun which looks down upon us that I have told you the truth. If I speak falsely, let this be the last time I behold his light. But it needs not much labor to go and inquire for yourself, the land whence the sun rises next to ours, to the east. Go and demand of him whether he will own you as a son. Phaeton heard with delight. He traveled to India, which lies directly in the regions of the sunrise, and full of hope and pride, he approached the goal whence his parent begins his course. The palace of the sun stood reared aloft on columns glittering with gold and precious stones, while polished ivory formed the ceilings and silver the doors. And I'll go on. You can read the, the, I mean, the, the account yourself, uh, if you will. I want to get to the, the key part here. Um, so Phaeton advanced up the steep ascent and entered the halls of his disputed father. He approached the paternal presence, but stopped at a distance, for the light was more than he could bear. Phoebus, arranged in purple vesture, sat on a throne which glittered with diamonds. On his right hand and his left stood the day, the month, and the year, and at regular intervals the hours. Spring stood with her head crowned with flowers, and summer with garment cast aside, and a garment, garland formed of spears and ripened grain. And autumn, with his feet stained with grape juice and icy winter, with his hair stiffened with hoarfrost. So he goes on to this description, and Phaeton then entreats his father to tell him um, if he is in fact his father. And uh, the youth said, this is what he says, O light of the boundless world, Phoebus, my father, if you permit me to use that name, give me some proof, I beseech you, by which I may be known as yours. He ceased, and his father, laying aside the beams that shone all around his head, bade him approach, and embracing him, said, My son, you deserve not to be disowned, and I confirm what your mother has told you. To put an end to your doubts, ask what you will. The gift shall be yours. I call to witness that dreadful lake which I never saw, but which we gods swear by in our most solemn engagements. Phaeton immediately asked to be permitted for one day, to drive the chariot of the sun. The father repented his promise thrice and four times. He shook his radiant head in warning. I have spoken rashly, said he. This only request I would fain deny. I beg you to withdraw it. It is not a safe boon, nor one, my Phaeton, suited to your youth and strength. He goes on to try to dissuade Phaeton from his request to drive the chariot of the sun. But see, the gods, while they're immortal, and unlimited compared to us mere mortals in what, they, what their abilities are. One of the things to which they are bound is when they make a promise and they swear upon, as he says here, he made that reference to this ancient lake. He, they, they make that reference, they make that promise, they have to hold true to their promise. So he goes, does all he can to persuade fate not to do it. Um, <clears throat> he says, suppose I should lend you the chariot, what would you do? Could you keep your course while the sphere was revolving under you? Now that's an interesting use of terms, sphere, sphere, right? So the Greeks are talking about a sphere revolving under the sun. Perhaps you think that there are forests and cities, the abodes of the gods and palaces and temples on the way. On the contrary, the road is through the midst of fight, frightful monsters. You pass by the horns of the bull, in front of the archer and near the lion's jaw and where the scorpion stretches its arms in one direction and the crab in another. Nor will you find it easy to guide those horses with their breasts full of fire that they breathe forth from their mouths and nostrils. He ended, but the youth rejected all admonition and held to his demand. 
So, having resisted as long as he could, Phoebus at last led the way to where stood the lofty chariot. While the daring youth gazed in admiration, the early dawn threw open the purple doors of the east and showed the pathway strewn with roses. The stars withdrew, marshaled by the day star, which last of all retired also. The father, when he saw the earth beginning to glow and the moon preparing to retire, ordered the hours to harness up the horses. They obeyed and led forth from the lofty stalls, the steeds full fed with ambrosia and detached the reins. Then the father bathed the face of his son with a powerful unguent and made him capable of enduring the brightness of the flame. He set the rays on his head and with a foreboding sigh said, If my son, you will in this at least heed my advice, spare the whip and hold tight the reins. They go fast enough of their own accord, the labor is to hold them in. Well, I'm going to skip over a few parts here. Um, so then Phaeton mounts the chariot, the gates are opened, the chariot is released, and then Phaeton begins to go on his wild ride. So it says, when hapless Phaeton looked down upon the earth, now spreading in vast extent beneath him, he grew pale and his knees shook with terror. In spite of the glare all around him, the sight of his eyes grew dim. He wished he had never touched his father's horses, never learned his parentage, never prevailed in his request. He is borne along like a vessel that flies before a tempest. When the pilot can do no more and betakes himself to prayers, he turns his eyes from one direction to the other, now to the goal whence he began his course, now to the realms of sunset, which he is not destined to reach. The clouds begin to smoke and the mountaintops take fire. The fields are parched with heat. The plants wither. The trees with their leafy branches burn. The harvest is ablaze. But these are small things. Great cities perished with their walls and towers. Whole nations with their people were consumed to ashes. The forest-clad mountains burned with fires within and without and Parnassus with his two peaks and Rhodope forced at last to part with his snowy crown. Her cold climate was no protection to Scythia. Caucasus burned, and Osa and Pindus, and greater than both Olympus, the Alps high in air. Then Phaeton beheld the world on fire, and felt the heat intolerable. The air he breathed was like the air of a furnace and full of burning ashes, and the smoke was of a pitchy darkness. He dashed forward he knew not whither, the Libyan desert was dried up to the condition in which it remains to this day. The nymphs of the fountains with disheveled hair mourned their waters, nor were the rivers safe beneath their banks. The earth cracked open, and through the chinks light broke into Tartarus, and frightened the king of shadows and his queen. The sea shrank up. Where water was before, it became a dry plain, and the mountains that lie beneath the waves lifted up their heads and became islands. The fishes sought the lowest depths, and the dolphins no longer ventured to sport at the surface. So, obviously, it's pretty catastrophic what's going on. So then Phaeton says, O ruler of the gods, if I have deserved this treatment, it is your will that I perish with fire. Why withhold your thunderbolts? Let me at least fall by your hand. Is this the reward for my fertility of my obedient servant service? Is it for this that I have supplied herbage for cattle and fruits for man and frankincense for your altars? Now this is actually Phoebus making this entreaty, right? So he says, save what remains to us from the devouring flame. O oh, take thought for our deliverance in this awful moment. Thus spoke earth, and overcome with heat and thirst, could say no more than Jupiter omnipotent, calling to witness all the gods, including him who had lent the chariot, and showing them all that, showing them that all was lost unless some speedy remedy were applied, mounted the lofty tower from whence he diffuses clouds over the earth and hurls the forked lightnings. But at that time, not a cloud was to be found to interpose for a screen to earth, nor was a shower remaining unexhausted. He thundered and brandishing a lightning bolt in his right hand, launched it against the charioteer and struck him at that moment from his seat, from existence, and Phaeton, with his hair on fire, fell headlong like a shooting star, which marks the heavens with its brightness as it falls, and Eridanus, the great river, received him and cooled his burning frame. Now, Several references there. With his hair on fire. Now, stop for a minute. 
Does anybody here in the audience know <clears throat> the meaning of the word, where we get the word comet? And what its original meaning was? Somebody must know. Hair. Long hair. There's a clue right there, right there in the myth. His hair on fire held, fell headlong, and again, like a shooting star. Two clues right there in that one little brief statement. And now the Italian naiads reared a tomb for him, and his sisters, the Heliades, as they lamented his fate, were turned into poplar trees on the banks of the river. And their tears, which continued to flow, became amber as they dropped into the stream. Now in some variations of the myth, his sisters, the Heliades, wept over his demise, and their tears fell to earth and caused the great flood. So right there, we have some very interesting connections. We have what, what the Egyptian priests are saying. Now, you guys have a myth, but it's not just a myth. It's talking about an actual declination of the bodies moving around to earth that from time to time caused a great conflagration of the earth and set it on fire. And there was just a little bit of the myth. Um, and even in the myth itself, there are clear references. Um, Go ahead and let's look at the fall of Phaeton by Sebastiano, 1703. So here we see Phaeton. Here's, here's Zeus. Zeus hurling the thunderbolt. We see the chariot plunging to earth. We see hapless Phaeton falling out of the chariot, falling to earth. There's another painting, which I'm going to go to right here. Let's see. This one. The fall of Phaeton by Gustave Moreau, who was actually quite a scholar in his own right and deeply immersed in some of the more esoteric traditions of old. I don't know where the inspiration for this particular painting came from, but as it turns out, it's all right there. You take a look, here's, of course, Phaeton, here's the chariot falling. Here is the, the, the belt of the ecliptic up here. Remember the reference to the crab, the scorpion, the bull, all of that? Clearly, it's talking about the pathway of Phaeton being through the, through the ecliptic. But then it deviates from the ecliptic, right? And begins to plunge towards the earth, begins to decline towards the earth. In this, we see something right here. We see the lion giving us the time frame when this occurred, the age of Leo. When did the age of Leo begin? Well, around 12,900 years ago. And it lasted for about 2,000 years. So until about 10,900 years ago, 10,800 was the age of Leo. Now, within that age of Leo, the entire Younger Dryas occurred, the beginning and the end. Okay. Also, I'm going to call your attention to what's here in the background. So Moreau, Gustav Moreau, wanted to make sure that the connection was very overt, because there you see the great comet in the sky right here behind. And then we see the serpent rising up from the earth. And the serpent, as we'll find out, was often a symbol for great forces both from within the earth and in the sky. The fiery serpent, the plumed serpent, etc. Now let me go back and just we'll do, look at the, the commentaries of Proclus on the Timaeus of five books translated from the Greek by Thomas Taylor back in 1820. And this is his comment about what we just read. The fable respecting Phaeton, however, requires a manifold discussion. For in the first place, it is necessary to consider it historically. In the second place, physically, and in the third place, philosophically. History, therefore, says that Phaeton was the offspring of the sun and of Clymene, the daughter of ocean, and that driving the chariot of his father, he deviated from the proper track. That Jupiter, also fearing for the safety of the universe, destroyed him by thunder, but he, being blasted by thunder, fell about Eridanus. The fire, likewise proceeding from him, burnt everything that was nourished by the earth, and his sisters, the Heliades, lamented his fall. As such is the historical account of the fable. It is, however, necessary to admit that a conflagration took place, for the whole narration is introduced for the sake of this, and also that the cause of it is neither an impossibility nor a certain thing which may easily happen. But it will be impossible if someone fancies that the sun at one time drives his own chariot and at another time being changed ceases to drive it and commits his proper employment to another. 
And it will be among the number of things which may be easily accomplished if it is supposed that this phaeton was a comet, which being dissolved produced an intolerable dryness from vehement heat. For this supposition is generally adopted. Porphyry, therefore, says that certain signs may be assumed from the motion of comets. So now, notice that Proclus is making this reference. This supposition that Phaeton referred to a comet is generally adopted. So in the day of Proclus, this was not some really eccentric idea. It was a common idea that the myth did refer to a comet. Some of you may have seen this graph before. This shows that there were two massive meltwater pulses to the world's ocean during the last deglaciation. In the older models, the introduction of meltwater into the oceans was seen as a generally fairly smooth process. You had an ascending limb, smooth curve, and then descending as the, as the ice melted away over many thousands of years. And that curve is represented by this dashed line you see here. That kind of represents the old view. But since the last 20 to 30 years, as we've learned more about post-glacial sea level rise, these peaks are what it actually represents the actual melting of the ice sheets and the rise of sea level. John Shaw and his colleague, John Shaw was a, um, a Canadian geologist who did a lot of work on drumlins. Some of you who've been watching the cosmography will know that you know, we've had people, we had Jerome Lessman on, uh, professor of geology from uh, Vancouver Island University, and Jerome Lessman was, is an expert on drumlins. We talked extensively about drumlins. He was a student of John Shaw. John Shaw coined the term catastrophic rise events, CREs. This represents two CREs, catastrophic rise events. Now, notice down here at the bottom, you've got the, the, chronology in years, thousands of years, from the present back to 18,000 years ago. Well, you see what happened here? There was two tremendous spikes of, of catastrophic melting of the ice sheets. Now, the dating of these is somewhat controversial. There was a range of dates, which are shown by that, like we've got a, a peak here that's green and one that's purple. So that was the range of dates, and you'll see that they range from right at uh, around 12,000 years ago to around 14,000 years ago. These dates have been refined since this graph was uh, first uh, contrived. There's a second peak. Now, this second peak, which is called down here, you see MWP, that stands for Meltwater Pulse. Meltwater Pulse 1A and Meltwater Pulse 1B. Meltwater Pulse 1B also defines the end of the Younger Dryas, it defines the end of the two and a half million year geological epoch known as the Pleistocene, characterized by this oscillating sequence of glacial interglacial ages. The end of that epoch and the beginning of our modern Holocene epoch in which history as we know it, civilization as we know it has arisen within the last, within that frame of time represented by the Holocene. The beginning of the Holocene date is precisely the same as the beginning of the date for Meltwater Pulse 1b, and that date turns out to be 11,600 years ago, precisely Plato's date for the subsidence of Atlantis. Coincidence? Well, if you're, if you're confined to orthodox thinking, then yes, that is a coincidence. However, I would suggest that maybe we need to look beyond the idea of a coincidence because how many coincidences are we going to find in this narrative as we go through it and, and dissect it and really begin to look at it? I'm going to guess not too many people listening to this have yet really delved into it to where they actually went and familiarized themselves with the myth of fate. Or the idea that right there in Greek mythology we have this myth which is very clearly pointing to the fragmentation of a great comet and a terrestrial conflagration, which we now know from the geological record can be an actual occurrence and did occur perhaps 12,900 years ago. What happened at 11,600? At this point we don't know. We don't see the signature of a cosmic event similar to what we see at the beginning of the Younger Dryas boundary, but that date, something happened because some 
forced some, some thermal input, some energy had to be introduced into the system in order to melt that ice very fast, which would have caused a CRE, a catastrophic rise event, and produce meltwater 1B, meltwater pulse 1B. So now I would raise the question, I don't know specifically what event the Phaeton myth refers to, or if it was a specific event or just a phenomena in general, I don't know. But clearly we now have overwhelming evidence of some kind of a great conflagration that occurred on Earth around 12,850 years ago. Accompanying that conflagration was tremendous melting of ice, great floods, and in fact, we know now that there was probably three episodes of great floods that ended the Ice Age. And again, going back to Plato, we heard him say that, we heard the priests tell Solon that there had been many deluges, but the Greeks only remembered the most recent one.